Uh, I had to write down because I'm going to go blank. I don't get nervous for my own talks, but I'm nervous for this. Um, so as most of you know, Marin is Emily's advisor. Um, and he, when he left, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to co-mentor Emily along with Marin. Um, and uh, so first, I'm going to give an introduction. Then Marin will give an introduction to Emily. Then Emily will give her seminar. We will have questions. Emily will give her acknowledgments. Then I'm guessing, I'm being presumptuous here, maybe 30 minutes later, we will reconvene again just outside for champagne, food, and cake um, uh, to celebrate Emily. Um, so uh, I, first of all, I wanna welcome Emily's family and her friends uh, from outside U Chicago, and of course, all of her friends and colleagues from within U Chicago. Um, uh, although I really wish that Marin was still here at U Chicago, his leaving, um, uh, gave me the very fortunate opportunity to be able to work with Emily. Um, I feel very grateful for that opportunity. Um, I have been so impressed with Emily, both scientifically and just on a personal level. Um, she has really enriched the Comstock Lab. Um, she comes to our lab meetings, she comes to all of our uh, lab events and just has really enriched our environment. I'm really grateful, Emily, and we're going to miss you immensely. Um, <laughs> I don't wanna say you were gonna go. <laughs> I don't have any started yet, okay. Um, so, uh, wow, okay, I'm really glad I wrote things down because I would be a big blank right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, so, just one more little thing, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to Marin. Um, Emily has her first author paper at a very prestigious journal. Um, currently, we're, she is revising it, and I was on a Zoom call with the editor, uh, with Marin and Emily, and Emily did this masterful job of responding, uh, discussing with the editor how she was going to address all of the critiques, and it was truly masterful. She did a better job, I think, than I could have done because I would have got, gotten emotional and she was completely matter of fact. Um, so Emily's paper, it, it looks like will be coming out in a, in a very big journal in probably a few months. Um, I think as a Comedia Microbiology community, we can be really proud that we are putting out people like Emily. We can just be really proud that she comes from our uh, institution and our committee. Um, and I know that whatever Emily chooses to do in her future, she will have a great success, but you always have your family here, okay? We are your scientific family. We are always here for you. So with that, I will turn it over to Marin. Thank you um, uh, for this uh, and for everything you've done, uh, Lori. Uh, I know uh, you played a very important role in Emily's journey uh, during the past uh, year uh, or two. Um, can everyone hear me, Emily? I'm holding the mic to the computer, so I think so, yes. Okay, fine. So I am very sorry for not being able to be there. Uh, unfortunately, my visa issues, I just can't travel to the US, US uh, in a heartbeat anymore. I'll just take uh, no more than three times, uh, three minutes of your time to introduce Emily. It is my great honor to introduce Emily, who is here today uh, with us to present her work on the past four years and defend her thesis. When Emily did a rotation in our group at the beginning of her PhD, she was not quite certain whether we were the right people for her, which was understandable since our group's interests were all over the place at the time. And while we cared about anything and everything fundamental to microbial life, we did not have a very well-defined project for a new graduate student to start pursuing immediately, which is arguably a huge risk to take for the student. But luckily for us, Emily was not someone who could be intimidated by the unknown or uncertainty, an attitude that defined her PhD. Due to a series of serendipitous and unexpected observations, we start to get more and more curious about plasmids often tiny dispensable genetic accessories that typically help microbes do better against changing environmental conditions. On the one hand, plasmids uh, are very well known to microbiologists due to their role in microbial lifestyles and utility in laboratory experimental zone and cultures and so on. But on the other hand, we were realizing that there was likely a huge gap in our understanding of the true diversity and ecology of naturally occurring plasmids. And such plasmids are notorious and difficult to study for multiple reasons. But Emily decided to let plasmids define the fate of her PhD, and we dove into the world of plasmids with very little evidence that we were going to come back to the surface with any new or valuable insights. 
Such a risk is one of the biggest nightmares of any advisor. And looking back, I'm not sure if, I, if there would be any success in this journey without Emily's brilliance in analytical thinking, determination to learn new things, and courage to face challenging and complex problems. In the second year of uh, her PhD, Emily had already become an expert of computation, in my opinion. From implementing her own Python and R programs to running tens of thousands of jobs simultaneously on high-performance computing clusters to make sense of unspeakable amount of metagenomic sequences, Emily was someone who could get away by calling themselves a bioinformatician. But she's one of very few people I met who, despite their prowess in bioinformatics, continue to appreciate the wet lab work and recognize that we are blind in omics without experiments to go after key questions. Bridging to the two ends of life sciences in that sense was the true goal of our group since its inception. And I owe a big thanks to Emily for showing that it was possible by splitting her time in front of the computer and the wet lab throughout her PhD. I remember Emily taking a well-deserved break in Hawaii in 2019. While she was waiting for her flight at the O'Hare airport, she wrote to me on Slack to tell me that she thought of an idea to characterize the ecology of the plasma we were interested in, and she could not wait to be back to Chicago to work on it. Perhaps it's not a good idea to mention this in front of an audience that includes Emily's family, who were in Hawaii with her. Uh, but this is how dedicated Emily has been to her science, and it's so satisfying to see the products of that dedication. Thank you very much for everything, Emily, and I'm very happy to witness the beginning of your successful tenure in science. The audience is yours. Okay, well, thank you so much, Marin and Laurie. That was very kind of you, um, and I will give back that, that acknowledgement at the end. <laughs> um, so I am very excited to be telling you guys today about what I've been working on for the past five years. And this is kind of a fun full circle because the first ever grad school class I had was in this classroom. So it's, it's fun to come full circle. And today I'll be telling you about my thesis, the title of which is Revealing the Ecological Interactions, Evolutionary Histories, and Niche Boundaries of Prevalent Human Gut Plasmids. So for the talk today, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to bacteria and plasmids. I'm going to be predicting plasmids. I'm going to tell you about our, our journeys in predicting plasmids from gut samples. And then finally, the bulk of the talk will be characterizing the lifestyle of a specific plasmid called PBI-143. Now, I know that not everybody in the audience is a biologist, so I'm going to start with this little primer about DNA. So I hope that all of you recognize this helical structure of DNA. And what I'll remind you is that in every single living cell, in every single living organism, there is DNA. And DNA encodes all of the information necessary to make the proteins that make up our bodies. And so in DNA, we have four different bases. We have A, T's, C's, and G's. A pairs with T and C pairs with G. And together, like I said, this encodes all the information necessary. And what we can do is we can extract this DNA from cells and we can sequence it. So that's what I'm trying to show in the background here is that you have these large, large sets of sequencing data that we can analyze, uh, that we can use to analyze these organ and any organism, really. Um, and so what we can do is once we've extracted and sequenced the DNA, we can start to build what we call the tree of life. And so here, every branch of this tree represents a different group of organisms. And the distance between the branches is telling you how closely related those organisms are. So to orient us a little bit, down here we have our eukaryotes. And these are every all the multicellular organisms you see on a daily basis. Your birds, your bees, your trees all make up this branch down here. Now, close, more closely related to the eukaryotes are archaea, and I'm not really going to talk about archaea today. I want to focus, of course, on bacteria. Bacteria are single-celled organisms that make up a huge diversity of life. So they live in all different types of environments. They live in hot springs, they live in the soil, they live in the ocean, and they live in our gut. Like I said, they make up this huge, huge part of the tree of life, and there's an incredible diversity of microbes that exist. Now, my favorite image of microbes is this. It's uh, microbes that live in the gut. And what I love about this image is even though it's false color, it shows this incredible diversity. You see all these different sizes, shapes, and you see that they're all interacting together. So it's this dense community of, of microbes that um, are all interacting with each other. Now, in order to get to this level of density, bacteria, of course, must replicate. And the way that bacteria replicate is clonally or asexually. So here's our bacterial cell at the top here, and here is the chromosome. Bacteria only have one circular chromosome, unlike humans that have 46. 
I did have to Google that. I could not remember how many chromosomes we had. <laughs> um, but in order to replicate bacteria, we'll replicate their single chromosome. So you are left with two chromosomes in the cell. The cell will start to pinch in the membranes and then eventually the cell will divide. So you have two identical cells. Now I said that this was a process of asexual reproduction. So in sexual reproduction, you have a male and a female that mate and you produce offspring. And that is a method of introducing genetic diversity into the population by combining the male and female DNA. But for bacteria, they don't have a method like this of introducing diversity into the population. And so they need other methods in order to do this. So one method the bacteria use to introduce, uh, to introduce diversity is through horizontal gene transfer. And horizontal gene transfer is similar to what it sounds like in the name. It's the direct transfer of DNA from one cell to another. So if you're having a bit of a hard time imagining this, the idea would be if I took out my DNA that codes for green eyes and put it into you, and now you have green eyes, that would be a horizontal gene transfer event. Okay, so like I said, this is a great method for introducing diversity into bacterial populations. And through this introduction of diversity, this allows for rapid bacterial adaptation to different environments. And the process of horizontal gene transfer is typically mediated by entities called mobile genetic elements, and these will often carry beneficial genes. So if we look over to the right-hand side here, I have two bacterial cells, and these are the bacterial chromosomes, or chromosome. And our first mobile element that I want to discuss are the bacteriophages or the viruses. So viruses replicate in the cytoplasm, or they can integrate themselves into the host DNA. And what will often happen is when they excise themselves from the host chromosome and move on to the next cell, they'll bring some of the host chromosome with them and transfer it to a new host. We also have transposons here, and these are sections of genomic material that are able to integrate into one context, and then often through a circular intermediate can excise themselves from that context and jump into a new genomic context. Now, in this case, this is a circular piece of DNA that I would call a conjugative plasmid. And so because we're going to be talking about plasmids a lot during the talk today, I thought I'd define this one a little more formally to tell you that plasmids are typically small, circular pieces of DNA that replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome. So that's a plasmid, but what is a conjugative plasmid? Conjugative means that it's able to form this bridge structure called a pilus in order to actually facilitate that transfer of DNA from one cell to another. And then the final type of mobile element I want to talk about are mobilizable plasmids. Now, unlike conjugative plasmids, mobilizable plasmids are unable to form this bridge structure, but they're able to hijack this bridge structure made by other elements and transfer between cells. And it's a, mo it's a mobilizable plasmid that I'll be focusing on later on in the talk. Okay, so I've been saying the word plasmid a lot, and I'm sure many of you in the audience are thinking, okay, you know, I'm very familiar with plasmids. I've used plasmids a lot for a lot of my experiments for expressing genes, let's say, and that's absolutely true. Plasmids have been an incredible workforce of molecular biology. But in addition to these plasmids, there are also, of course, naturally occurring plasmids. So for example, there's plasmids that will carry virulence factors and it'll make their bacterial host more pathogenic. There's plasmids that will carry metabolism genes. This will allow the host to, to use different nutrient sources it might not have been able to previously. There's plasmids that carry antibiotic resistance genes that allow their host to be resistant to antibiotics that might be present in the environment. There's this large diversity of plasmids that exists throughout my microbial communities. But one question we can ask is why are plasmids maintained in cells? And this might seem kind of obvious, you know, they might, they, you know, I just told you that they carry these beneficial functions that allow the host to adapt to new environments. And so absolutely, that would be a reason to maintain plasmids. But the trade-off of maintaining a plasmid is that the host cell must also provide its own resources in order to replicate the plasmid DNA and produce those proteins. So you can imagine it's kind of a push and a pull between how costly is it to replicate the plasmid DNA and how much of a benefit are you getting from the plasmid. But I want to add another layer of complexity here and talk about something that we call in the field the plasmid paradox. And this, again, is asking the question, why are plasmids maintained in cells? So I'll try to explain that now. So if we have our bacterial cell, we have our chromosomal DNA, and we have our plasmid DNA. And you can imagine that on this plasmid, it contains a gene for antibiotic resistance. So when antibiotics are present in the environment, this cell is doing much better because it has this plasmid. What happens over time is if, the, if that selective pressure is maintained for long enough, 
through processes of recombination, this antibiotic resistance gene will jump onto the chromosome. And so once this gene has moved onto the chromosome, this plasma now becomes a little bit redundant for the bacterial host. And it's actually better for the bacterial host if it starts to lose this plasmid. It will be more fit in the environment without having to replicate that additional DNA. But if we imagine it from the plasmid's perspective, that's not great for the plasmid. It wants to be replicated. And so there's a few different method, or there's a few different um, explanations for why plasmids are maintained in cells to explain this plasmid paradox. But I think the one to me that is most convincing is that plasmids are able to, uh, to transfer between cells at a high enough rate in order to combat this level of being lost from cells. If you just move on to the next host before you're lost, you'll maintain yourself in the population. And this was debated in the field for quite a long time because the question was, are these rates of horizontal gene transfer fast enough to combat the loss of plasmids from cells? Now I keep showing these, these conjugation bridges. And so I just wanted to point out that we can actually see this under the microscope. This is a scanning electron micrograph of bacterial cells, of three bacterial cells, and they've formed these pillar structures between them in order to transfer DNA. Okay, but I wanna return now to this tree of life thinking about bacteria, because now you know within bacterial cells, there's also this plethora of genetic elements that are critical for many functions of bacteria, like adapting to new environments. But what happens is a lot of the time in microbiology, these are quite difficult to identify, specifically in complex environments. So we end up when we're building trees like this or, or trying to identify new environments and we're describing the species, what happens is that we end up missing the plasmids that are present in those environments. Yet these are really critical aspects of these communities to study and can almost be thought of as a separate unit from the bacterial host. Okay, so this brings me to this question of how can we identify plasmids in complex environments? And first, let's define our complex environment. So I said that this could be soil, this could be water, but in our case, because we study the gut, this is human stool samples. So that's what I've tried to illustrate here is with this magnifying glass is, or magnifying glass is um, that there is a diversity of cells that exist in this environment, and many of these carry plasmids. And a tried and true method for identifying the plasmids present in this environment is to take your, take your sample, culture it on an agar plate, you'll get a bunch of bacterial colonies, and you can pick an individual colony to grow in a tube. You now have an isolate culture, and through different methods, you can extract the, the plasmid DNA from this isolate culture and send that for sequencing. And then you understand the plasmid content of those cells. But the issue with this approach is that there is much more microbial diversity in nature in, in this population than what we're able to actually culture in the lab. And so this means that we need a different method for identifying plasmids in complex environments. So one method that's used generally to study these complex environments is metagenomics. And so to define a metagenome, because I'm gonna be talking about these a lot throughout the talk, this is the entire DNA content of an environment. So if we take this, its environment and extract all of the DNA, this would be the, the, metagen uh, the metagenome. And I'll explain that in more detail in a second. So since most environments harbor many different organisms, this metagenome includes genetic information from a large collection of genomes. So like I said, uh, we extract the DNA from this, this sample and we shear it into these short reads in order to accommodate for the sequencing chemistry. So then what we get back from sequencing is this large collection of short DNA fragments. And you can think of this kind of like if you tried to take out uh, some library books, basically you're only able to extract the sentences. So you have a big bag of sentences. And what we want to do is rearrange those sentences back into the books. And so we do the same thing with these metagenomic short reads. We look at the overlapping regions of these short reads and we assemble them into longer continuous contiguous fragments of DNA called contigs. And so if we return to this question now of how can we identify plasmids in complex environments, we can ask the question, okay, if we have these two contigs and we're curious which one of these contigs is a plasmid, one method that we can use is to say, okay, well, we've identified that on this contig, there is a canonical plasmid gene. So we can say, okay, we think that this sequence is a plasmid and the other one is not. And if in, in this toy example, we color plasmids as red and chromosomes as blue, in this case, we were correct. This was a plasmid. But the issue with this approach is that we miss all of these other plasmids that are also present in the metagenomic assembly. So this means that we need a different approach in order to identify all of the plasmids in a complex environment.
Oh, my mouth is dry. Okay. Um, so this brings me to the second part of my talk. And this is where we, uh, where we focused on predicting plasmids from gut samples. And this was in collaboration with Mike Yu, who is an incredibly talented scientist uh, with a very extensive machine learning background. So, uh, so together with Mike, we were able to develop a machine learning model in order to identify plasmids from these metagenomic assemblies. So the way that we did this is we took, the, we took a database of plasmids that already exists, and we took a database of chromosomes from NCBI. And the first thing we did with the, our reference sequences is that we cut these all into 10 KB slices. So we, we made them shorter because we didn't, want the, we didn't want the model to learn that longer sequences means chromosomes and shorter sequences means plasmids because this won't always be the case in our metagenomic assemblies. So from there, what we did is we took, we went, we went through and identified all of the genes that are present in each one of these segments. And then that's what we trained the model on. So we, we told the model, okay, learn which of the genes are mostly present on plasmids and which of the genes are mostly present on chromosomes. And through doing this, we were able to then present the model with new sequences that it had never encountered before. And then it was able to identify which one of these are plasmids. So it does this by assigning a different coefficient to each one of these genes based on the training from our data sets. Po positive coefficients mean it's more plasmid-like, negative coefficients mean it's more chromosomal-like. And what happens is we sum the coefficients between all of these genes, and this gives us, through our model, it gives us an output giving the probability that this sequence is a plasmid. So we can do this uh, for both of these, and we see that the sequence on the top is a 0.95 probability or 95% chance, according to our model, that this sequence is a plasmid, and the one at the bottom is, has a very low probability of being a plasmid. So to, the take home message from this, if that was a little bit much, is that we can assign any given sequence a score designating the probability that it is a plasmid. And so to just really hit this home, if we go back to our toy example, now what would happen is we would go through and for each of these plasmids, each of these would be assigned a different model score. And as long as it's above 0.5, we consider that a plasma. Oh, okay, well, it's unfortunate it's a little bit cut off. Let me see if I can. Okay, um, so what we decided to do, it's a little bit cut off, but I'll just tell you is that we said, okay, well, we have this model trained now, but now we want to identify plasmids from real ecosystems. So we went through and we, we downloaded a collection of 1,700 metagenomes uh, from NCBI. And we, used, and we went through and we predicted plasmids from each of these metagenomes. So depending on the depth of sequencing and the number of samples, you'll get a different number of plasmids predicted, as well as just depending on the environment. But altogether, once we collapsed redundancy, we had 68,000 unique human gut plasmids. And what this allowed us to do is that this, this size of a collection of plasmids um, had never been uh, demonstrated before. And what this allowed us to do was do large scale analyses of plasmids. And one of these in particular is that we were able to define what we're calling a plasmid system. So, in or, so I'll try to describe that to you now where a plasmid system relies on a backbone plasmid. It relies on identifying a backbone plasmid. And this backbone plasmid we require, we require to be circular in the environment and is made up of backbone genes. And backbone genes typically encode things like replication or transfer, sort of like your quote unquote, like essential plasmid functions. But in order to comprise the whole system, you also need to have compound plasmids. And a compound plasmid contains these backbone genes, same as the backbone plasmid, but also has this additional cargo DNA that it's taken up into its uh, plasmid genome. And we can identify multiple compound plasmids where they all share these conserved backbone genes that are present in the backbone plasmid, but they've taken up different cargo genes onto the, onto the backbone. So we applied this, this uh, analysis to all 68,000 of our, or yeah, all 68,000 of our plasmids, and then we were able to identify 1,100 plasmid systems. Now, I know that this is a little bit overwhelming to look at, so I think that it's better if we just focus on a single plasmid system, and I'll zoom in on this. So here we have our backbone plasmid that contains those essential functions necessary for plasmid replication. And then you can see that it radiates out into many, many different compound plasmids. And if we look at the genetic context of these compound plas or of these, uh, of these plasmids, here in gray, we have all of the backbone genes. So we have this replication gene, 
We have a toxin antitoxin system that's a common uh, uh, gene pair that's found in plasmids. But then we also have all of these different cargo genes that have been taken up on different plasmids. So we have a tetracycline resistance gene, we have a beta lactamase gene, we have a histidine kinase. These plasmids that all share the same backbone have taken up different types of cargo, likely dependent on the selective pressures that are present in that environment. Let me see if I can get rid of this. Sorry to the person. Sorry, Fernando. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so, but we still had this collection of 68,000 plasmids and we were curious, what is the ecological distribution of these plasmids around the world? We have access to these 1700 metagenomes from all over the world. And so what we can do is we can take these metagenomes and like I said, they are these short DNA sequencing reads and we can match each one of those reads to a reference sequence. So in this case, our reference sequence is this large data set of predicted plasmids. But before I show you the predicted plasmids, I actually wanna show you the database of known plasmids first. So this is our known plasmids. Again, on the, uh, on the columns, we have each one of these columns is an individual metagenome. And then each one of these rows is a different plasmid that already existed in a database prior to our analysis. And the, the intensity of the green color here is showing you how present that plasmid is in that environment or in that metagenome. And what you can immediately notice is that these, these known plasmids, this is a pretty sparse heat map. You know, there's not a lot of known plasmids that are present around the world or globally prevalent in our set of metagenomes. Now, in contrast, the predicted plasmids are, uh, is a much more, more, much more populated heat map. And what this means is that our predicted plasmids are much more prevalent across this set of metagenomes and are better at capturing the true diversity of plasmids that exist in these environments. So the take home message from this section is that we identified 68,000 human gut plasmids and characterized their evolutionary relationships and their distributions across human gut metagenomes. Okay, so this brings me to the third section of my talk, which is characterizing the lifestyle of a specific plasmid called PBI-143 that I'll probably also refer to as PBI because that's just a mouthful. Okay, so to get into the PBI story, I wanna go back to this figure and point out to you one plasmid in particular that piqued our interest. So we had, this plasmid was interesting to us in particular because it was the most prevalent known plasmid in our set of known plasmids and was also identified by our prediction model and again was, was prevalent across these metagenomes. And because this was already a known experimentally characterized plasmid, we were able to go into the literature and say, okay, what, what is this sequence? And it turns out that it's this plasmid called PBI-143, and it was discovered in 1985 by someone named Jeffrey Smith, who I hope is on the call. I invited him, but I'm, I'm not sure if he's on there. Um, so, so this plasmid was interesting to us because it only contains two genes. So it contains a gene for replication and a gene for transfer called REP-A and MOB-A. And I just spent the last, you know, 15 minutes telling you all about how plasmids are so necessary for bacterial adaptation. And and encode these important genes. But of course, on this plasmid, we don't see any of those beneficial genes. There's no antibiotic resistance. There's no metabolism genes. There's nothing on this plasmid to explain why it would be so prevalent across so many individuals. And so this was interesting to us and we decided to investigate this a little bit further. And so in order to do this, I scaled up our collection of metagenomes to 4,500 metagenomes so that we had a, uh, at least one representative cohort from each continent across the world. And we use that same technique of read recruitment to say, take all of the short reads from these metagenomes and recruit them to our, our plasmid sequence in order to look at its distribution. And what I found through doing this read recruitment is that there's actually three different versions of this plasmid. So there is uh, what I creatively called version one, two, and three, which differ, <laughs> which, which differ primarily in their REP-A genes. So these are about 75% identical at the uh, nucleotide level. And so, okay, well, you're still interested in what is the distribution of this plasmid? And so this is the data I'm showing you here. So on the y-axis, we have the proportion of individuals that carry PBI-143 in their gut. And on the x-axis, I have all of the different countries that we have samples from. And this is just a little bit of metadata at the bottom. And what I want you to immediately notice is that in more industrialized countries like Korea, China, Canada, the US, there's very high levels of this plasmid. This plasmid is incredibly prevalent within these populations, up to 90% of individuals have this plasmid in their gut. 
And then in contrast, in less industrialized countries like Fiji, Bangladesh, or Madagascar, there's very low levels of displacement. So it seems like there is sort of a geographical distribution of PBI. Now, in addition to this, there's actually also a geographical distribution of the different versions. So version one dominates in North America and Europe, but version two dominates in Asia. And version three is quite rare. It's, it's uh, not very prevalent around the world. Okay, so in addition to prevalence, our reader recruitment data will also tell us how abundant this plasma is within a single individual. So that's the data I'm showing you here. So now on the y-axis, we have the percentage of reads recruited to PBI 143, or you can think of like how abundant is this plasma within a single gut. And every each of one of these points here is an individual gut metagenome. And so if we look again, we see that there's a higher abundance of PBI in more industrialized countries and lower abundance in non-industrialized countries, and this makes a lot of sense. But if I, what I want to bring your attention to is the y-axis. So it goes up to 1%. I think some of these metagenomes go up to maybe 3 or 4% of uh, the entire sample being taken up by this plasmid, which might not seem like that impressive of a number. But if you remember that this plasmid is only 2,700 base pairs, this means that it's incredibly numerous in this environment. And it was actually this observation that really uh, pushed us to continue to investigate this plasmid. Okay, so we, we knew that this plasmid was present in the human gut, but we next asked the question, is PBI present in other environments? We know it's present in humans. What about something far afield? Let's say marine samples. So we did the read recruitment. It's not present in marine samples. What about something more closely related to humans, non-human primates, not present in non-human primates? What about something that interacts with humans a lot, not present in pets? The only other environment that we found this plasmid in was in sewage. And of course, this makes a lot of sense. Human fecal material is a large component of sewage. And it was this that prompted us to ask the question, okay, could we use PBI as a marker of human fecal contamination? And to ask this question, we teamed up with Sandra McClellan and Melinda and Melissa from her lab. And Sandra has been studying wastewater for a very long time and has a large collection of both water and sewage samples. And so to think about this a little bit more, the way that people had initially looked at whether or not there was fecal contamination in water was looking at E. coli coliforms. But the issue with this approach is that you don't know that it's human specific. So Sandra's group has developed these markers that are human specific and are able to detect when there is human fecal contamination in water samples. And of course there is uh, human feces in sewage. So we were curious, how does PBI stack up compared to these markers? And it turns out that PBI is actually an even more sensitive detector of human fecal contamination in these samples. And there was a handful of samples where PBI was the only marker that was amplified. Sorry, I should have pointed out that the copy number of each of these markers is on the y-axis. Um, and now, of course, this brings up the caveat of, you know, how sensitive do we want to be? If there's a tiny bit of human fecal contamination in samples, does that matter very much? But at least this way, we have the ability to detect across that full spectrum. Okay, so we knew that it was prevalent. We knew that it was abundant. We knew it was specific to the human gut. So next we said, which organisms in the human gut actually carry this plasma? Now, it was fortunate for us that over in KCBD, um, the Duchessois Family Institute has a large, large collection of gut bacterial isolates. And so what I did is I went through this collection of isolates and I identified all of the instances where an isolate contained PBI. And so here I'm showing you the phylogeny of all of those species, and they all fall within the family Bacteroidales. So there's Bacteroides, Parabacteroides, and Fecalicola organisms that carry PBI-143. But we wanted to take this question a little bit further and ask, okay, well, there's different versions of this plasmid. Do different versions replicate differentially in different species? Uh, in other words, does version one have a set of species that it typically replicates in? And so in order to do, and actually I should point out that this hypothesis made a lot of sense because the rep A gene is what interacts with the host replication machinery. And this is what differs primarily between the versions. So. We thought this hypothesis made a lot of sense. And then so in order to test it, we built a phylogeny based off of PBI-143. Now there weren't any isolates that had version three. So this phylogeny is just based on version one and two. And you can see it nicely separates out version one from version two and 
each branch of this tree is a different bacterial isolate, same on this side. And so what we would expect to see is that if PBI preferentially, if PBI version one preferentially replicated in a certain group of organisms and, P and version two in a different group, we would see a nice smooth um, correspondence from version one to its hosts. But if these versions replicate interchangeably between different species of hosts, we'd expect to see more of an interwoven pattern. And this is what we saw. So it looks like there is not actually host specificity of version one versus version two. But what I should point out is that within a single isolate, that isolate will only contain one version of this plasmid. And indeed, in most individuals, they only contain, like, for example, in my gut, I only contain one version of this plasmid. I've checked. <laughs> okay. So the next question we wanted to ask was, what is the mutational landscape of PBI-143 in the human gut? In other words, what kind of evolutionary or selective forces are at play on this plasmid? Now, I'll remind you that there's three different versions. And so what we said is we have these three different reference sequences. Let's use some, a DNDS ratio to calculate if there's adaptive evolution, if there's neutral evolution or purifying selection that's acting on this plasmid. And to define DNDS for you, this is a common metric in molecular evolution to calculate the rate of synonymous or non-synonymous mutations between two or more sequences. And so when I say synonymous mutation, I mean if there's a mutation in the DNA, it does not change the protein sequence, whereas a non-synonymous mutation will change the protein sequence. And so when we calculated this DNDS ratio for our three versions, we found that this plasmid was under pretty intense purifying selection. So this was interesting to us, but we said, okay, well, you know, we have 4,500 metagenomes. Let's scale up this analysis to all 4,500 metagenomes. But in order to do that and use a DNDS uh, ratio, we would have to assemble all of those metagenomes, which is quite computationally intensive. So instead, what we decided to do is we went back to our read recruitment results, which there... <laughs> sorry, I Zoom people. I'm sorry, I'm just not responding to the things in the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you're messing up for the rest of us. Okay. Um, so in order to, so we went back to those read recruitment results and in the, the reads that are recruited to our reference sequence, we not only can determine what the prevalence or abundance of, a, of our reference sequence, in this case, PBI is, we also see where mutations occur in those different samples. And so what we were able to do is say for each individual metagenome, what is the number of single nucleotide variants? Or you can think of like, what is the number of mutations that are present in that metagenome. And then we also have, uh, we've divided it on the, on the x-axis into whether or not those mutations match one of these three versions or whether or not they do not match one of these three versions. And what we would expect to see is if the majority of mutations in these metagenomes do match one of our three versions, we would expect to see um, much, more, much more of these, these mutations in this column. And indeed, this is what we see. So we see that 83% of the single nucleotide variants or SNBs that are present in metagenomes from all across the world match one of these three versions. And what this allows us to say is that we can extrapolate this idea that if these three versions are under purifying selection and most of the mutations in our metagenomes match these three versions, that across most of our samples, this plasmid is under purifying selection. Now we wanted to take this even one more step further and this was thanks to a lot of help. Well, really, Phoebe and Matt did this analysis. Um, and so the next analysis I want to show you is that from these mutations, we can tell, again, like I said, we can tell whether or not this is a synonymous or a non-synonymous change, whether or not it, it affects the protein sequence. And what we can do is we can superimpose that data onto the crystal structure. So we can say, OK, all of the, all of the instances of non-synonymous changes superimpose that onto the protein structure itself and see whether or not are those mutation or are those um, amino acid changes, are they distributed throughout the protein or are they localized to specific places? And so here is the crystal structure. And uh, just to orient you a little bit, the crystal structure is shown in red and orange. Um, this is a prediction from alpha folds and it's uh, telling you how uh, confident the prediction is in these regions. And then I'll remind you that mob A binds to DNA. So that DNA is shown here in gray. It binds to DNA, nicks the DNA, and allows the plasma to transfer from one cell to another. And so here we've superimposed these single amino acid variants, or the, the changes to the protein sequence we've superimposed 
onto here as these um, spheres. And what we saw was that this, this um, variation in the protein sequence was actually localized specifically to the section that binds to DNA. So this allowed us to hypothesize that perhaps the variants that we're seeing across all, again, this is across all 4,500 metrics, we primarily see changes in this region. This is suggesting to us that different versions of this uh, mob A protein are able to um, bind slightly different sequences of DNA. Now, we don't have any experimental evidence for that. That's just our hypothesis. Okay, but this brings me to, I almost want to say like the elephant in the room. This was something that I always wanted to, uh, to investigate throughout my entire PhD. I was like, okay, we can, we can see all these cool things for our metagenomic data, but like what really is the relationship between PBI-143 and its bacterial hosts? So to start to investigate this, um, I, I said, okay, well, we know what its hosts are now. We know it's Parabacteroides, Bacteroides, and Ficaea coli. So we can estimate the host abundance within complex environments like our gut, and we can compare that to how abundant PBI is. So that's what I have for you here. On the y-axis, we have the abundance of the bacterial hosts, and on the x-axis, we have the abundance of PBI. And what we'd expect to see is if this plasmid negatively impacts its bacterial hosts, we'd expect to see a negative correlation between these, uh, between these two uh, axes. But if this plasmid benefits the bacterial host, we would expect to see a positive association. But there's a little bit of a caveat here because we would also expect to see a positive association if this plasmid is just a neutral hitchhiker. So we see that there is a positive association. And so this was interesting. We were like, okay, we can probably narrow it down that it either has some kind of benefit to these, ho to these bacterial cells or it's neutral and it's just along for the ride. But again, in order to really investigate this, we needed to actually test this experimentally. And so what we wanted to do was construct a strain of, of bacteria that has this plasmid and have a, gen a genetically identical organism that doesn't have plasmid so we can compete these two together and see which one grows better um, in culture. Okay, and I'm gonna walk you through this. Uh, this is with a lot of help from Mark. But I'm going to walk you through this because this was a very painful year and a half for me. And so uh, we're all going to suffer through it together. So this to construct genetically identical strains with and without this plasmid. So to start with, we decided to pick Bacteroides fragilis. This is a well-studied gut microbe. We know that it hosts this plasmid and we'd worked with it in the lab before. Now, what you would normally do is you would say, okay, I'm just going to put my plasmid into cells and then I'll just select for the cells that have taken up this plasmid. But because this plasmid only has two genes on it, we can't just select for the cells that have PBI. So another option is we could just insert a resistance marker into PBI, but we didn't want to do this because this could disrupt the native function. We don't really know how this plasmid functions. We didn't want to just insert something into its genome in case this changes it for a downstream experiment. So instead, Mark had this incredible idea that I carried out after a long time of learning Gibson assembly of constructing this larger vector. So we have the PBI-143 is in this section here, and then we have this little repeat region of PBI. And then on the rest of the vector, we have uh, these different selection markers. And so what we do is we said, okay, well, we can transform this into cells because now we have these selection markers. And then we engineered in this repeat region so that we have a recombination event that happens within this region of the plasmid. And what happens when you have this recombination is you're then left with two plasmids one is our naive PBI-143, and one is all of our selection markers. And then through um, selections and screens, we're able to identify the cells that have lost those selection markers but maintained just our naive sequence. Okay, so after a, a lot of work, we got to this stage, and I was so excited. I was like, okay, I can't wait to start doing these competition experiments where I grow both of these types of bacteria in the same tube and see which one grows better. And just to point out, I confirmed that this plasmid does not transfer between cells. Um, like I said, it doesn't have conjugation machinery. And this, if it was able to transfer, would mess up our experiment. So we made sure that wasn't the case. And then I cultured these together. And then after you culture them together, what you do is you, uh, you spread them out onto plates and you count the number of colonies that are present of each cell type. And so I was like merrily going on my way doing this. And I was like, great, look at me getting these results. Um, and then this is around the time that I joined Lori's lab and Lori was like, oh, why don't we put this in a mouse? That makes a lot more sense physiologically. So I was like, okay, that's fantastic, but I don't know how to do mouse work. Um, so Lori, together with Maddie and her lab, did all of these experiments for me 
of doing these competitions in mice and then plating out the, uh, the colonies. And, and Maddie did, I'm sure, hundreds, if not thousands, of PCRs. And so I'll show you the results of these competition experiments now. So on our initial input into the mouse, we want to have about a 50-50 ratio. We want half the cell subplasma and half to not. And then by day eight in the mouse, we were so excited. Look, five out of six of our mice have increased levels of cells with PBI compared to the ones without. So I was so elated. I was like, oh, there's, there's a benefit to having this plasmid. I'm so stoked. And then at day 14, it's a more complicated story. So many of them have reverted back to 50-50. Some are higher, some are lower. <clears throat> this isn't super conclusive. And we're actually in the process right now of extending this experiment much longer, but uh, it's a bit of a cliffhanger waiting for those data. So, but the take home message from this so far at least is that there isn't a radical fitness impact of PBI on its bacterial hosts. It's not either decimating the population or completely being overtaken uh, one way or the other. So we continue to think and we were like, okay, what are other ways that this plasma might be functioning in this ecosystem? And so we said, okay, maybe it functions more like a backbone. What if PBI-143 is the backbone of a plasmid system and it's really able to incorporate genetic material into its backbone? And through our metagenomic data, we found out this is indeed the case. So here, for example, is a uh, plasmid sequence where PBI-143 is the backbone and it's incorporated this additional cargo material into its genomic context. And we actually have a handful of examples like this. It's not super common, but we definitely can find these in our metagenomes. And so what we're proposing is that the way that PBI-143 functions in the ecosystem is uptaking certain genes that are selected for, transferring these between members of the population, and when those genes are no longer selected for, reverting back to its more naive, less uh, costly state. We don't have any experimental evidence for this. This is just our, our hypothesis. Okay, the last set of science slides that I want to show you is this question of, does PBI-143 respond to stressful environments? So it's pretty well established that, in general, bacterial cells that contain mobile elements, in bacterial cells that contain mobile elements, these mobile genetic elements, when the cell is stressed, will increase their copy number. The idea being that they want to transfer to a new host so that they don't go down with the sinking ship. So we wanted to see, is that the case for PBI? So we had this patient isolate that has PBI, and now on the y-axis, I'm showing you the copy number of PBI per cell. And on the x-axis, I'm showing you over time. And so the experiments that we did is that we exposed these cells to oxygen because they're anaerobes that live in the gut. Oxygen is quite a stressful environment. So we exposed these cells to oxygen for varying periods of time and measured the copy number of PBI on a qPCR. I should have put Karen's photo here, and I'm really sad I didn't, but thank you, Karen. was very involved. I don't know where she is, but was very involved in these experiments. Um, okay, so here's our control, never exposed to oxygen. And at one hour, we see that this looks about the same as our control. One hour of oxygen exposure, not a big difference. But at three, six, and 12 hours of oxygen exposure, we see that the copy number of this plasma does modestly increase. And then in the arrows here, where we return these cells to the anaerobic chamber and remove that stressor, the copy number of this plasma then comes back down to these control levels. So it looks like PBI does respond to these stressful environments by increasing its copy number, but then this is a transient uh, phenomenon where it, it comes back down to control levels once the stress is reduced. So most of the experiments with mobile elements uh, looking at copy number have been done in culture. And so we said, can we scale this up a little bit more and look at this, this increase in mobile element copy number in naturally occurring stressful environments? And so a naturally occurring stressful environment in the gut is inflammatory bowel disease. And IBD is characterized by oxidative stress, similar to the stress that we had just put these cells through in the previous slide. And so with the help of, of Amy Willis from the University of Washington, well, actually with a lot of help from Amy, we were able to develop a method, I hope she's also on the call. Um, we were able to develop a method to approximate the copy number ratio of PBI-143 in the gut. So you can imagine this is uh, the copy number of this plasmid within a gut metagen. And then we did this on a per bacterial host level. So I think if I show you a little bit of data, it'll make a little bit more sense. So if we take our favorite Bacteroides fragilis, we now have our healthy samples are in gray and our IBD samples are in purple. And we've estimated the copy number for each one of these samples of PBI. And in this case, the copy number of PBI in the IBD samples is higher than in the healthy samples. And this actually holds up for every single organism that we looked at. 
So for each, in each one of these cases, the copy number I is significantly higher in the IBD samples than in the healthy samples. And so there's the potential, uh, perhaps in the future, of using this marker as a method for determining gut stress. Okay, so in summary, I started by characterizing the ecological distribution of 68,000 human gut plasmids and used this concept of plasmid systems to determine their evolutionary relationships. Then we identified a specific plasmid called PBI-143 that is prevalent and abundant across human populations. It replicates in bacteroidales, it's specific to humans, and it looks like it's under purifying selection. And then finally, we determined that while PBI-143 does not impact its host fitness, it responds to host stress and it's able to acquire additional genetic material into its backbone. Um, and then to zoom out a little bit more and just think generally about my PhD, I'm going to try to summarize this in one sentence, which is that although we primarily study micro uh, microbial genomes within these microbial communities, plasmids and other mobile elements play really critical and important roles that we need to understand in order to fully understand these uh, theories within microbial ecology and that you never know, you might, you might uh, discover some interesting practical applications along the way. And that's all, thank you. Okay, so to start with, I'd really like to thank the Committee on Microbiology uh, and really the University of Chicago in general. When, when I applied to grad schools in the US, this was the only school I got into. <laughs> and I don't know if Glenn knew that when he took me off the wait list. <laughs> um, and I really feel so fortunate to have come here and I have just a lot of gratitude for the university that really changed the trajectory of my entire life. Okay, so to start with, I want to thank Marin. Um, <laughs> I, when I had my first meeting with Marin, I had zero intention of joining the lab. I was like, I don't know anything about genomics or bioinformatics, and I don't know what the command line is. And to be honest, I wasn't really interested in learning. Um, but after a few weeks in the lab, I was completely sold. Not only did it turn out that I loved genomics, but Marin had cultivated this lab environment with this level of like sharing and camaraderie that I had never experienced in any of my undergrad labs. We had a Marin-funded snack drawer and a beanbag chair in the lab, and we were living the startup dream. <laughs> but, uh, but really, throughout my PhD, Marin pushed me to learn so many things that I never thought that I would be able to do. I'm not sure if his video's on, but I'm going to look at him while I'm saying this. <laughs> so many things. Oh, he's like, no, no. <laughs> so many things that I, I never thought that I would be able to do. And I can confidently say that so much of my scientific success comes from his unwavering support. Um, and not only was it incredible to work with Marin, but we had this amazing lab culture. And I think probably one of the best examples of this was one of my first months in the lab, Evan, who I also hope is on Zoom, um, spent six hours with me one day to just teach me how to use R. And it really expedited my whole journey in learning how to code and learning how to analyze these big data sets. Um, but really, this was like the general sentiment in the lab. And I can honestly say that I've enjoyed working with each and every member of the Marin Lab at UChicago. <clears throat> Okay, but of course, all good things come to an end. And in my fourth year, Marin moved to Germany. And so I joined Lori Comstock's lab. And this is the only photo I have of me and Lori. Um, <laughs> but I'm hoping after today we'll have some more. And with Lori, it was kind of a funny story because she had come to U Chicago years previously to give a talk in my second year. And at the time, Marin and I were like, okay, don't tell her anything. She's the perfect lab to scoop us. <laughs> And I know now that she never would have, but, um, but then when she came to U Chicago, we were like knocking on her door being like, please help us with this. Um, and so I ended up joining Lori's lab when Marin left. And I can really say that I am just so grateful to Lori for, for giving me a second scientific home. I, uh, I've lost track of the number of times that I've laughed and cried in your office. And uh, I feel so fortunate to have you as a role model and, and really a sounding board for everything scientific and otherwise. Um, and I'm really thankful also to the other members of the Comstock Lab um, who have been a, a great, like I said, scientific home for the last couple of years. Okay, next I would like to thank Mike. Um, Mike was like a third unofficial advisor to me. We probably spent more than 300 hours together on Zoom writing and editing the plasma prediction paper. And during that time, I learned more about science, writing, and really life than I ever would have expected. Okay, next I'd like to thank my thesis committee. Um, I, I really feel like I always look forward to our meetings. I felt like we were just like 
six people putting our heads together to come up with ideas about my project. And I don't know how many people can say that they have every single member of their thesis committee on their final paper, but I'm, I'm really happy to have you all on there. Okay, next I'd like to thank my grad school friends. Uh, Micah, Steven, Matt, Courtney, Evan, Kat, Devin, Jimmy, <laughs> Vaughn, Fernando, Liz, Alessandro, Bear, and everybody else that I haven't named. Um, I had way more pictures than I could possibly fit on this slide, but you all made this experience a hundred times better. Okay, now if you don't know this already, I, I used to compete in Olympic weightlifting, but I injured myself pretty badly in November of 2019. And what followed that injury was three really tough years of chronic pain that it was like nothing I had ever experienced. And I think that I'm really happy that I've gotten to the point now that I can reflect on this experience and, and start to recognize some of the really valuable lessons that it also taught me. And I, I think I'm a lot more grateful for the simple things in my life now. I, I you know, I've, I've been forced to let go of my ego in many situations, mostly at the gym. Um, and it's ultimately changed my perspective on what success means to me. And, and I think that in many ways, this is a very solo journey, but I also had a lot of people that helped me on the road to recovery. And in particular of all of these people, I would like to thank Dustin, who I also hope is on the call. Um, Dustin, through some, I would say, pretty necessary tough love, has helped me to get through both the mental and physical aspects of recovery and is the main reason that I've been able to get back to lifting in the last eight months. Okay, and then finally, I wanna thank my, my mom and my siblings who are here today. Uh, this is a picture of us from 2004. And, and I think we've all gone through a, a pretty big glow up in the last uh, 20 years and we've, we've made some new additions recently, but I'm so grateful to you guys for your, your ongoing support and I love you so much. I'm so happy you can be here. That's all, that's it. <laughs>